Good morning. It's Friday the 7th of July 2017 and a warm welcome along to the Mirable Studio in Royal Berkshire for this morning's United Kingdom talk. Morning boys and girls. Um, just uh, starting a little slightly serious note here and I've been watching um, sadly, you know, very, very sad story really going on at the moment with that little boy Charlie Gard. Now, uh, you know, that's the one, that's that's the tiny little boy, and he's in hospital at the moment, and um, the uh, doctors and that say he should have the machines turned off because he's got no chance of recovering. And I, I can't quite work out why, why nothing else is happening there, because um, we've got all these other people coming out now and offering help, I'm sure... I'm sure anonymous people all over the place have donated money. Uh, they want to send the boy to America, don't they? For some experimental treatment. Now, you know, if 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 you've got if you've got some sort of chance of um uh something that they're already doing working, then I could understand that you wouldn't want, perhaps, to have the experimental treatment. But th th according to the doctors here, he has no chance. That's why they want to turn off the machines. He's got no chance at all. I mean, it must be awful to be those parents try fighting uh, against the system, really. You know, all the doctors over here saying, well, no, no, no chance at all. We're going to have to turn them, you know, not as blasé as that, but uh, you know what I mean. You know what I mean, saying there's no chance at all whatsoever. And people are offering to do things, and uh, the ones that come into my mind at the moment, we've even had Mr Trump. Mr Trump offering to get the boy over to the States and try, try something. You would want to try anything, wouldn't you? As a parent, you would, I mean, even if you had some, say you've got something yourself, right? And you've been told there's nothing they can do here, you're going to die. And then someone comes along and says, look, I've got this experimental drug. I'm not sure if it'll do anything, but would you like to give it a try? You would want to, wouldn't you? And old Trump has said, you know, we're willing to bring the boy across and try something in our hospital, all free of charge, because they don't look a very rich family. They haven't got much money. Um, we've even had the Pope. We've even had Pope Francis uh, in this morning's sun. The U.S. facility, uh, let's have a look. Let's. There's fresh hope for Charlie Gard. Oh, sorry, hang on a minute. No, that's, where's, where's me Pope Francis one? Yes, that, oh, that's the new one, okay. Uh, yes, Pope Francis also has offered to give him uh, a Vatican passport, I think it was, so that he could be flown and looked after in the Pope's private hospital. I've seen that. And in this morning's uh, newspapers... Charlie Gard's Fresh Lifeline, this is in the sun this morning, as U.S. Hospital offers to send experimental drug. They're actually offering to send the drug to Great Ormond Street and confirm they will take him if legal obstacle, ob, uh, obstacles are cleared. The U.S. facility made their two offers hours after Pope Francis declared he wants to give baby Charlie Gard a Vatican passport. Uh, the facility, which cannot be named for legal reasons, also confirmed they would leave, uh, would admit the little boy into the US if legal hurdles could be overcome. And I'm sure there's people, you know, in in the American, um, <clears throat> what do they call it, Parliament thing, uh, the customs in America that that would see this story. You know, okay, this is a special case. Get him straight here. I'm sure that would be the case. And I don't understand why nothing's happening. It seems from the stories that are going around that it's the British hospital or doctors that are stopping all this from happening. And I don't understand why. I, I get that. I, it's a terrible thing to say. I get the feeling it's it's to save face, you know, and you can't play about with little lives like that, can you? The US hospital said it would treat the boy with an experimental drug pending approval from government regulators, the Food and Drug Administration. It is not certain if this drug would be approved for use in the UK. And you see, you know, this is the other thing as well. Uh, going from country to country, some countries allow some things, including drugs for medical reasons and all sorts of other things as well, you know. And other countries allow different things. And this is the thing. 
It said it's agreed to admit and evaluate Charlie, provided that arrangements are made to safely transfer him to our facility. Legal hurdles are cleared and we receive emergency approval from the FDA, that's an American thing, uh, for experimental treatment as appropriate. It added, alternatively, if approved, we will arrange shipment of the experimental drug to Great Ormond Street Hospital and advise their medical staff on administering it if they are willing to do so. And um, I, I, I don't understand why this hasn't happened yet. The story so far, it goes on in the sun to tell you this morning, Charlie Gard is in the terminal stages of a disease called uh, mitochondrial DNA depletion syndrome after both of his parents were unknowingly carrying the family faulty gene. Sufferers of the condition do not get energy to their muscles, kidneys and brain, and typically fatal in infancy and early childhood. The 10-month-old is said to be one of only 16 people to have ever had the condition. They raised uh, £1.3 million to send him to America for treatment, but doctors at Great Ormond Street Hospital said Charlie should be allowed to die in dignity and applied for permission to have his ventilator switched off. The European Court of Human Rights, <clears throat> which is like, you know, the last, at the moment, uh, the last thing that we can go to here in this country, the European Court of Human Rights ruled the doctor's decision would be upheld and his parents were not allowed to intervene in their child's case. The family were given extra time to say goodbye before his life support is turned off. Now US President Donald Trump and the Pope have offered to help as Charlie's army vocalised their support for him all over the world. British doctors say their hands are tied and they are unable to let the top fly to Italy, so the Italian foreign minister called for crisis talks with Boris Johnson, who backed the doctors and court's decision. I, I don't get it. Theresa May also confirmed she supports Great Ormond Street's decision not to let Charlie fly. She was set to speak to Donald Trump about the child's fate at the G20 summit. Uh, as his followers continued their support. The Pope declared on July the 6th he wanted to give the youngster a Vatican passport to help him travel to an Italian hospital for treatment before a New York hospital offered to admit him and even ship experimental drugs uh, to the UK. So so we wait, really, with, with, with bated breath um, on this awful story. You know, I I, I just think that if a chance is offered, it should be taken. I really do. Anyway, that's that's the um, uh, story. It's just been going round and round in my mind all the time. Why don't they just bloody well let him go? I don't... I'm not a medical person, but, you know, if there was any pain on, on moving or anything like that, I don't know. You know, surely they can shove a load of drugs in him to keep him sort of... Uh, what would you say? Uh, kind of in a in a sort of state of not knowing what's going on. You know when they give you you give, they give you drugs and that before a certain operation. If if they don't want to knock you out completely, they give you certain drugs so you don't know what's going on. Maybe they could give the little boy that or something so he can jump on a plane or I, I don't know how it works. But for Christ's sake, give this boy a chance. I don't understand it. All right, let's go to some of your messages this morning. And welcome along to you all. Uh, good morning to Danny Davis in Wrexham and Wales. Morning, Danny. Hope you're well this morning. These are people just joining us uh, uh, this morning. John Springate's there in España. Hola. Hola, John, my good mate, John. I saw your new red jacket in a picture the other day. That is astounding. That suits you down to the ground. And it, and it is down to the ground as you're so short, I think. It's actually touching the ground, isn't it, John? But <laughs> I love your new red jacket. Good morning, John. Uh, Ashley Yero. Ali, yeah, hello, Ashley. Hello, Ashley. Welcome. Diane Jebs there this morning. Morning, Diane. Wendy Young. Morning, Yang. Wendy. Uh, John says they've killed off Rayner in Nashville. What's that? Rayner. I don't know what that is. Is that some sort of TV program or something? <laughs> I'm not quite sure what that is. Morning, John. Uh, good morning to Matthew Joplin. Morning, Matthew. It's your birthday today, isn't it? I'm not doing the birthdays yet. That's at the end of the show. Birthdays are always at the end of the show. Do you know, it's interesting. I'll, I'll let you into a little secret here. Talking to those of you that watch and join in the show for what I'm doing now, OK? Most of you, this is true, this is true. Most of you switch off when I get to the birthdays, OK? The birthday people... Don't watch any of this bit, but simply skip through to their birthday message. 
That is true, that is. I don't think there's anyone that watches the thing from start to end, including all the birthdays. Which one are you? Yes, exactly. I think it's outrageous skipping through my programmes. How dare you skip? This is, it's like, like you do that sort of thing when adverts are on the telly, isn't it? Dear me. Wendy likes the shirt. Thank you, Wendy. I've got a new shirt on this morning. Uh, this was given to me by my best friend, Wet Ron, who is at this moment having his hair cut. He's coming around about 11 o'clock and uh, we're going swimming this morning. And I've got to pay for my annual swimming pass today. Oh, that's an arm and a leg, I'm telling you now. But it's only a one yearly payment and I just pay it. And it cost me about uh, about 40, but it's about 42 pound a month to use a swimming pool where I am, which I think is very reasonable. I, I, I well, I, I should be going every, you know, Monday to Friday, but actually at the moment it's a little bit less. I'm finding lots to do at the moment, including the Slimming World thing. On Tuesdays, of course, I go to the Slimming World. I've lost uh, 12 and a half pounds so far in just uh, four weeks. I'm pleased about that. But this is, uh, yeah, this is a present from Ronnie when he went to, where did he been on holiday? Malaga. Ghastly place, dear. Malaga. Oh, my God. Hope you're nowhere near like that, John. Hope you're in a reasonable area of Spain. Bloody Malaga and Torremolinos, dear. Do me a favour. Um, on the subject of what we were just talking about, yes, indeed, John said they should be allowed to take him out of the hospital and try to do anything. Danny Davis says it's not guaranteed to work. No, it's not, Danny. It's not guaranteed to work. But there is a chance. Wouldn't you take that chance? Wouldn't you take that chance? No, it's not guaranteed to work. Nothing's guaranteed in this world. There's, there's no guarantee I'm going to make it to the end of this show before I drop down dead. There are no guarantees in this world. But if there's a chance, I think you should take it. I really did. Wendy says the parents should be able to try. No one should have a right to stop them from doing that. I, I, I totally agree with you. It's absolutely true. It really is absolutely true. Uh, good morning to Craig Hart. Craig Hart, he says, what are you wearing? A shirt. Don't you like it? I love this. I love shirts with designs like this. You know who wears shirts like this? The, um, oh, God, what's his name? He's in Holby City. Sasha. Sasha in Holby City, although his ones are slightly larger than the ones I'm wearing now. Sasha in Holby City wears shirts like this. I'm glad you like it. <laughs> what are you wearing? Don't you like it? <laughs> Morning to Alan Russell, who says, uh, have a great weekend. Thank you very much. Uh, Danny wishes the family all the best. Yeah, me too, Danny. Me too. Me too. Good morning to Tony Power. Um, uh, Mark Goosh is with us this morning. Morning, Mark. Uh, Jason Carter's also in Spain. We've got lots of people in Spain watching this morning. España, hola. Although I think we might be getting better weather than you at the moment. We've got about 30. Well, I looked on my car yesterday. 31 degrees we had here yesterday, which was very, very hot. Morning to Tony Power says, if you were a parent, you would see where the parents are coming from. From the child should be given every chance. They absolutely should. They should be given every chance to take that boy abroad. Um, you know, if we can't do it, so, you know, that's fair enough. They've admitted they can't do anything here. I don't have a problem with that. But for Christ's sake, let them go try somewhere else then, you know. A bit like that, isn't it? Good morning to Benjamin. Morning, Benjamin. Hope you're well this morning. Are you not selling your perfumes somewhere today, dear? Benjamin sells really expensive perfumes in... Oh, no, is it? It's either Harrods or Harvey Nicks, one of the two. I think it's Harvey Nicks. When I say really expensive perfumes, I mean these little bottles of perfumes are thousands of pounds. I mean, there was nothing wrong for, with Brute, was there? Come on, lads. There was nothing wrong with splashing a bit of Brute on or something like that, was there? Nope, he sells perfumes. Harrods, oh, it's Harrods, thank you. He does Harrods. Re what is the most expensive perfume you sell, Benjamin? I'm dying to know. You know. I mean, my sister, occasionally, you know, she gets out a bottle of Impulse. Psst, 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 and it's a bit like that. I don't know how much that is. It's about one pound of, one pound of blooming, uh, <laughs> one pound a bottle or something like that, is it? <laughs> um, what is your most expensive perfume that you sell in Harrods Perfumery? There you go. £75,000. How many of those do you sell in a week? Huh? How many £75,000 bottles of perfume do you sell in a week? Jeez, that's a lot of money for a little bottle of smell, isn't it? I don't wear anything like that at all. My favourite aftershave, 
which I don't want. I never put aftershave. Very, very rare do I put. I t- no, I, I lie. I've got this bottle of lemon stuff that I bought from the hairdressers for five quid. And you spray it on. I think it's, is it Dior? No, not, it's Durant. Durant, some, I don't know. But it's a sprayer. And it really stings. And it's a lovely lemony smell, which lasts for about three seconds. I often put that on just before I go into work. I've got a bottle in the car. Just, so if you're if you're outside Central Station tonight as I come in and you get a waft of lemon, you know I've just sprayed my stuff on. You can have a bit if you want. Sometimes I have to keep this uh, spray stuff with me wherever I am DJing because some people that come into the pubs do smell. Um, uh, this is not a joke. There is actually a particular person whose name will remain nameless. He's not always there. Sometimes it's a... He stinks. He absolutely reeks. It's awful. Awful. So I do have a bottle of spray next to me sometimes. Uh, It's actually disinfectant. Disinfectant. And I look at the person as they come up. And while they're singing, I'll quietly give them a good spray, you know, to kill any bacteria that may be trying to leap from them onto me while they're warbling away. Very, very bad. Very bad. Um, Benji says once a year they sell that, but we are selling fifteen thousand pounds back once a month. What you sell that seventy five thousand pound bottle of perfume for fifteen thousand pounds once a month? Or you must let me know the date. I'll buy three or four. <laughs> Maybe I can sell them for an, an eBay for for a profit. Would that work, Benji? Could I have a bottle, you know, to give away as a gift or something like that as a prize for a competition? As and you know, you get all the advertising. You know, the millions of people that watch this program. You know, just imagine I could expose myself. Sorry, expose you. No, expose the Harrods perfumery department just by having a little bottle of perfume on day. And you can now buy this from Harrods, only seventy-five thousand pounds. I mean, I think Harrods would be pleased if I took up their advertising like that. What do you reckon? For the small price of a couple of bottles of that £75,000 perfume. Eh? Could you bring one round? Well, can I at least touch one? I've never touched anything that's worth £75,000. Never touched anything that price. Only the house. And maybe the car. Although that's not worth nowhere near £75,000. Gosh, dear me. Do, you mean? do they still do Old Spice? Yeah, I don't know. Do they still do Old Spice, Alan wants to know. Do you remember that? Old Spice. Oh, I can't remember how the, how the jingle goes for that one. Benji says the average of perfumes are between £375 and £595. Top floor Harrods. Oh, that's, we don't want to cheat one, Benji. No, we want the 75 grand. I want it sitting here behind me. Even just for one show, can I borrow one? Would I be able to have a little dab? Do you think I could have a little dab? Do you do testers? Could you send over a tester? <laughs> send over a test. Let, hang on. Let me get my... I've got a spare yellow one. Uh, uh, a spare spare lemon one. I'll show you the one I've got. Just a minute now. <coughs> Here it is. I think it comes from Turkey. Is the spare one. There it is, look. Duru. Do you sell that one? Five pounds. Limon, it says. Limon. See it? Do. Lovely smell. This all lemons. One minute. Oh. Oh, that's a lovely smell, that is. Put it on my microphone as well while I'm there. Now I can breathe it in while I'm speaking. Do you sell that one, lovey? Eh? Eh? <laughs> it's probably the same stuff. Come on. Send us one of those 75 grand ones across. <laughs> John Aitken says there's nothing worse than bad BO and uh, and um, and bad air smells from your back passage. Oh, it's so dreadful, isn't it? Of course, it got worse in the clubs when they stopped the smoking. You could smell everyone's BO. And some people smell worse than others, John, I tell you that. I hope you don't mind me saying, John, but it was sometimes you used to come up to me and ask and have a chat with me. I did notice an awful odour coming off you. I really did. <laughs> this is the spray that I use while I'm at work. 
And if I detect someone who's smelling a bit while they're singing, I come up behind them and start spraying. I will not have smelly people on my stage singing songs. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Benj. <laughs> morning, Ray Reynolds. Ray Reynolds is joining us this morning. Um, oh, you can still get Old Spice in boots. I can't remember the jingle to Old Spice. Do you want me to see if I can find it? Because all this stuff used to have little jing nice little jingles and that. Did you know Barry Manilow wrote loads of jingles for adverts and things like that? Old Spice ad. Let's see if we can find that. I think it was 19... Wasn't it 1970s? Was that one? Uh... No, I can see new ones. Old Spice commercial, 1970. Let's try that. So it's a man on a, on a like a one of those boards on the sea. Become yourself. Here we go. Here we go. You'll find success. <laughs> Old Spice. <laughs> the classic fragrance. Oh. Oh, you can't, you can't go wrong with a bit of Old Spice, Benjamin. Come on, darling. Old Spice and Brute are back in fashion, apparently, with some male celebrities. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Does anyone else use um, aftershave at all? As I say, I, I don't. I do spray this a little bit on uh, before I start work, but that's about it. Surfboard, yeah, that was it. It was on a surfboard there. What else do you, um, what else do you, uh, what else do you wear? Anything like that at all? Old Spice, yes indeed. So last night I finished the show, I had dinner, um, <clears throat> some rice and some of my homemade corn stew. I Then I watered the garden, That's that took ages, because I've got a front garden and a back garden. Now the front garden, admittedly, some of that isn't mine, it's like council area, but I kind of took it over and I look after it, and I've got a lot of plants and things in it. I don't own it, you know, if the council come along and decided to bulldoze through or put a block of flats there, then they could do that. But um, I, I kind of, you know, mowed it back a bit. Because it, it, basically it was just all brambles. All brambles and ferns. So I mowed it right down to, to nothing. And then I put a black plastic sheet over it and cut holes and put all different plants in it. So it looks quite nice over there. Uh, but everything was drooping. It was drooping like that last night just before I started the show. So I thought I'd better go out there and uh, uh, water it. I'm not getting bitten so much by the flies. Um, usually you go out sort of... Let me think, sort of May time, and you can't go out there in shorts or short sleeve shirts because you get bitten like hell, and all little red itchy things come up. There was no biting last night, so I was quite pleased about that. Then I came back in and uh, watched some television. I watched an episode of The Met. Is anyone watching that, The Met? Oh, that's an excellent programme. Um, and it's basically what the police in London have to do. There's a very, very good-looking one on there. I must say, is him, and they're both, they're both quite young, actually. He's got a slightly Asian appearance to him, and his thin, chiselled face, and his friend is um, a, a lady. And I think they, the two of them should be together, actually. They get on really well together. And all sorts of things you see them getting up to. Um, one boy, they, they shoved him against a wall and this massive great knife dropped out of his belt. I mean, it was massive. It wasn't a kitchen knife. <clears throat> it was a something like you'd see on um, on Pirates of the Caribbean. It was as big as that. And this bloke's going, this, and he's a boy. I'm telling you, he's a boy, about 18 years old. Oh, don't know where that came from. Where's that come from? That kind of come out of me and all that business. Oh, it's horrendous what they have to deal with. I don't know how anyone can become a policeman. I think it can't be for the money, can it? You must want to just make a difference to people's lives. I think that's what it is. And uh, I also watched this programme about landlords. Does anyone see that? The day the landlord moved in. I think there's been three of them so far. And basically, it's about uh, tenants who they move out of their homes and the landlord moves in to the home that they're renting out to see what sort of conditions it was in. And I remember a particular one on there. Uh, the lady's name was Linda. She is 66. She's quite old. 60, well, I don't know if that's older. 66 isn't old anymore. What's old now? About 80, isn't it? 80 is old now. So the lady's about 66 years old, sort of mid-aged there. And um, she's not got a lot of money. She's got three jobs. Uh, she does a lot of caring for people. And she gets up, I think, in the morning at 5.30am because she has to get two buses to work. And she was saying, basically, I just pay 
pay, I, I, I work to pay my rent. And she, why, why haven't you retired yet? She says, because I can't afford to. I'll have to just keep working and working and working until whatever. She pays for this place £950 a month. I think it's a two-bedroomed flat somewhere over East London way, a little bit further out perhaps than, than East London or just just kind of on the inside. Of that. £950 a month she pays for this, uh, two. I think it's a two-bedroomed place. And it shows inside, she's got mould everywhere, one of the taps doesn't work at all, she can't get any hot water out of it. Um, the kitchen unit's all, the cupboard under the, the sink is all like, you know, it's that it's that crap wood, what's it called, MFI type stuff, you know, where it's like little bits all joined together. Oh, what's that called? Something board. Oh, God, I can't remember now. You know, little bits of wood and they put a bit of plastic either side of it and they call that a piece of wood and it's not is it it's not really um so that's that's all kind of blown and bumpy and all that business uh the cooker well i mean the rings they're like solid rings one of them's like that where it's it's just worn out and all rusty and there's a smell in there anyway so she moves out and the landlord moves in <clears throat> And it starts off where the landlord's going out and they, they open the door and they say, what is that smell in here? And of course, it's the mould. Very dangerous to have mould in your house. My mate had it, actually, in his um, uh, in his bedroom. And it was in the top two corners. He had it in the top two corners and around the window. And uh, we looked at his window. And there were gaps. And he said there were drafts coming out the gaps. Anyway, he had the window replaced. The mould went. Mould went and no more drafts. So it was definitely the window. So, you know, he took action on that straight away. But this lady, oh, this is all this mould. They've gone in there. So what is this smell in here? And so they've gone around the house. And said, My God, look at all this mould. See, the landlord didn't know. They didn't know. No one had told the landlord. <clears throat> It, it was quite bad. It's not the worst I've ever seen mould in a place, I must admit. I had a problem in one of my places. I kept getting mould somewhere. So I had to, at considerable expense, I had to have a hole put in the wall, like a vent going out. Um, I had anti-mould paint and that sort of thing. It's quite expensive sometimes to have some of this done. Not always, sometimes. And indeed, um, in the past, this landlord... I'd had a machine put in. I think it's called a dehumidifier. It was like actually on the wall. And that was supposed to clear up most of the problem. Also in there, he saw the cooker. That was all. He said, well, that's dangerous, that is. I didn't know about that. And the he said, there's a tap here that doesn't work. And, he, and at the this is all at the beginning of the show. And he said, well, quite frankly, the property isn't being looked after. He said, I'm quite shocked that it's like this. As the programme went on, um, they realised that the woman, like they, they found her electricity bills and things like that. And she was really struggling to keep up with, with all these payments. Anyway, it, it turns out that the lady, then they met up with the lady and says, you know, well, we found all this mold. She says, well, yeah, well, why didn't you tell us about it? We would have come and sorted it out. She'd never said anything, you see. I think what it was, she was worried that if she said anything, they'd kick her out because she didn't have a leasehold, uh, a, a, a tenancy agreement either. And when you go and rent a private places, you need to have a tenancy agreement. All my places, right, I have a year tenancy agreement. So if you was to move into one of my places, you sign a tenancy agreement, you're kind of safe for about 12, for 12 months, and then you have a new one again. Unless, unless you or me want to finish the contract, that's okay as well. I think I have to give three months notice. Um, I can't remember what you would have to give, though. But you would never want to do that unless you want to sell the place, you know. You want to come out of it, kind of come out of the, the business altogether. But you need some sort of tenancy agreement. If it's just rolling over, you've got no rights at all. Yeah, not... Hello, landlord here. I want you out next week. That's terrible. That's terrible to have no security like that. 
all my places have got like long term tenancy agreements. One one year usually. They're usually a year. Sometimes people ask for a bit less. Sometimes, very rarely, they, they actually do ask for rolling contracts. Maybe they're, they're going to move on at some point soon, but they don't exactly know where it is. And then that's up to me to say, yeah, OK. I usually say yes, you know, just keep someone in there for a little bit longer. But I think she was worried about being kicked out. So that's why she never said anything. And the, the landlord, it was actually two. It was father and son, right? So the father was very, very business orientated, a little bit like the estate agent that looks after my place. I don't look after my places myself. I pay an estate agent to do that. Right. The son was a little bit more. Ah, oh, yeah, but she's an old lady and all this. Now, that's me. That is why I have to have an estate agent look after my place. Because if someone said to me, oh, look, I'm really poor at the moment. I can't pay the rent this month. I'd probably say, oh, well, that's OK. You know, leave it this month. But you can't really do that because next month it's twice the amount. Do you see what I mean? You can't let it go like that. I would. I would. But you mustn't. So that's why I give it to someone else. They have to deal with all the dirty work, I'm afraid. You do have to run it like a business. But the son was very much... You know, very much um, more compassionate, like myself, to this uh, elderly lady. So anyway, they're having this meeting, and the meeting went okay and all that business. Uh, the father, they, they, they then had to decide what to do. The son wanted to refurbish the whole place. Oh, by the way, they had also made uh, investigations because there's a new, I think, train line coming through the area which could get them a lot more rent. Now... They went in to see an estate agent and the estate agent told them they could get 12, 12 and a half hundred pounds per month for that flat that at the moment they're renting out for 950. So they already know this, right? So the father or the son is saying, well, I think I'd like to refurbish this whole place. It's, it's clearly a problem. We need to sort out the mould and a new cooker and all this business. And, and the kitchen as well was a bit... Is a bit um, is a bit worn where the the, the mould had been leaking down and water had been leaking down. And of course, all the wood has started to expand and all that business. The father is saying, "Well, she hasn't looked after this. We probably spend seven thousand pounds doing all that up, and then she does, and then it'll go the same way again in a couple of years." And they're kind of a little bit like this. And the son had actually had tears in his eyes, he said, but she's got no money. The mould, one of the reasons the mould was there was because she can't afford to heat the bedroom. They stayed in the bedroom for a week and they were, they were in their clothes. It was so cold. Uh, what happened in the end was they did indeed do up the whole flat. The sun got his way. They done up the whole flat. They left her rent at £950 a month, which is still... And the son was saying, look, you know, we can make more profit, but we still make a profit at 950 Let's just leave it there because, you know, she needs someone to rent. Uh, they gave her a two-year tenancy agreement. And they said, you need to leave the heater on low, at least in the bedroom, to stop this mould coming back again. If you have problems with your electric bill... Let me know and I'll pay the difference. So you see, there are some people with hearts. So that was an excellent programme. That was only one of the stories. I think they had three families on there altogether. Another bloke who, who buys houses in Milton Keynes, like three bedroom houses, and then converts them to, to houses of multiple occupancy. They're called HMOs. I don't have any of those. Mine, if I buy a one bedroom flat, it's a one bedroom flat. I don't convert it to three bedrooms. I mean, I, I just cannot imagine living in a room. Uh, years ago, I was married, 1983, and we lived in a room in Ellsfield. Oh, it was an oh, awful place. Awful, and it had a smell to it, you know, a smell. And we had to share the kitchen and the bathroom. Well, we, ne we never did. Never, never used the kitchen, not once. I think we had a little two-ring cooker, I think we had, that we had a... In, in the room that we rented. It was just one room. Do you know, I, 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 I can barely remember that room. I know it was dark. It was a very dark room. I, I actually can't remember anything about it. Isn't that strange? But people, they do. They live in rooms and they pay hundreds of pounds a month, especially in London. They pay hundreds of pounds a week to live in a tiny little room, probably with no heating or anything like that. It's awful. Anyway, this bloke had a place in Milton Keynes. 
And what he would do is buy three bedroom houses and then split them up into like five rooms. And he would rent each room separately. So you rent a room and you all share the kitchen and the bathroom. And this woman's room was, was really nice and well looked after. But the kitchen area was a disgrace. The trouble is with these places, no one can decide in the house who looks after the kitchen. Who hoovers the hallway? Who cleans the step outside the front? It doesn't happen. Excuse me a moment. Can I just blow my nose? One minute. No one can decide who does those bits. So these areas get really scummy and horrible. Like the entrance hall where all the bikes were. So the landlord went in and, and was shocked by the state of the hall and the kitchen. And then he went in her room. And it was beautiful. She kept it really nice. So that is an excellent programme. There were three stories on there last night. And it's on every week. I think it's on 9 o'clock, maybe Tuesday, Wednesday or th Maybe Wednesday or Thursday night on BBC One Colour, I think it is. Look it up. It's called um, Landlords... Oh, The Day the Landlord Moved In or something like that it's called. Really excellent programme. Have you ever lived like that somewhere? Have you lived anywhere that's that's really bad? If so, why don't you ring up and tell me today on the show? Lines are now open. 020-8144-3477 is my local London number, OK? I'd love you to call in today and tell me if you've lived in a place that was horrific. Or maybe just not so nice. Or maybe, you know, you rented a place and you were really happy with it. You ring in about that as well if you want to. 020 3477 is my local London number. If you've got Skype, you can call in as well. Uh, I've got Skype, username, United Kingdom Talk. Skype, username, United Kingdom Talk. Or the phone line, 020 3477 Okay? Uh, Ashley says, there was one poor program called Nightmare Tenants Slum Landlords. I haven't seen that one. I haven't seen that one, actually. Is that any good? Is that, is that one any good? Let's take a call. Adam the Plumber's online. Greetings, Adam. Good morning, Chris. How are you? Morning, Adam. All right. You're calling yeah, in about the uh, slum landlords, are you? <laughs> I, I am indeed, yes. Yes, I've, I've been there, seen it and done it, got the T-shirt. Oh, yeah. Um, basically, I lived in a place in just around the corner from where David Rosen used to live, actually, in, in Hornsey. Oh, Holloway Road. Holloway Road. That's oh, it's yeah, awful a, there, isn't it? Awful place. Yeah, go on. It is. I had a um, I had a bed set there, um, and basically it was a friend of mine that had had the place and wasn't staying there, so he used to let me stay there for nothing. Um, and it was it was awful. It was um, the place was a complete building site most of the time. Um, there was I I had to share the room with two rolls of carpet. Was he, he stored carpet in there, did he? Yeah, two, oh. two, two rolls of carpet, which, right. which stayed, stayed there the whole six weeks that I was there. Um, and the mould in the bathroom and kitchen was unbelievable. It was actually mushrooms growing out of the bubble in the bathroom. Oh, my word. Yep. And, of course, you're breathing all this in, aren't you? Because it chucks out yeah, spores, doesn't yeah, it, at spores, night time? Yeah. Spores. It, yeah, the black, the black spores. Yeah, they're very uh, quite dangerous. <clears throat> and of course, at the time I had asthma, so it just um, made it I've worse. Grown, so it just made it worse. I mean, I've grown out of that sin. Mm. So yeah, that was uh, in pretty poor condition. But uh, it's, it's like the one that I'm renting now um, in Sidcup. <clears throat> when I moved into that, that was in an awful state. Did it? Did that have mould as well, or was it just run down? <clears throat> yeah, no, it had. It had. It got mould in the in the bathroom as well. But then you see. The um, the reason that is is because number one they never ventilate it. They don't. Sorry, say that again. They don't ventilate. Yes. Yep, that was uh, from uh, number two. Uh, oh, I'm, I'm losing. Uh, we're losing having, you here. Are you driving I'm, along? We're losing you. Is that any? Hello. Hello. Is that any bit, Chris? Am I back? Yeah, just about. Go on. Yeah. Sorry. So um, yeah. No heating at the moment, so I'm having to put in my own night storage heaters. Right. And the last thing that I discovered the other day, um, it's got a communal loft. Right. And there is no insulation in the communal loft at all. Oh my God! Cost you an arm and a leg to heat that place. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go out and buy a couple of rolls of uh, loft insulation and throw them up there. Right. They're not they're not over expensive, you know. I don't know, fifteen twenty pounds a roll. And right. I'll okay. Do do it in two rolls, <clears> and that will save an absolute fortune. Because I was speaking to my neighbour next door, and she was telling me the flat is the flats are extremely cold in the winter. Yes. And I thought, well, that's unusual because these are well built well built properties. They were built in the sixties, um, and they're well built constructed brick. So I thought it's a bit unusual that they're that they're cold. You know, especially if they if they're brick built. You can understand it if they're concrete built because that, that that does you know they hot in the summer and cold in the winter. But as this one was brick, um, it's well constructed. So I thought, oh, I wonder if the, the loft's insulated. Anyway, I got my ladders out, went up into the loft, completely empty, not a single stick of insulation. No anywhere. insulation. My God, that'd be cold. And that that add to the mould problem as well, won't it? Yeah, it will. Yeah, because again. I mean, to, to be fair, most of the bathroom problems with mould are because people don't open the blooming windows or no. or they dry their clothes indoors and they don't open a window. That That's that's the biggest cause of mould. And you go that's round right. there and say, well, uh, have you been... Oh, yes, yes, we've been ventilating the place. And you know damn well they haven't been because that is the major... The main cause of mould in a house is people drying their clothes in a flat without opening the windows. You know, you've got to feel sorry for the people that you know, there's nowhere else to dry them years ago yeah, exactly. when we had um <clears throat> proper council blocks of flats and things like that there would be an area somewhere outside with washing lines for people they'd done away yeah. with all that you know no let's put another couple of flats up in their place instead and actually in in the uh <clears throat> excuse me in the 50s and 60s blocks they had this thing of having communal laundry areas that's right. Yes, um, yes, we had one. I never forget. We had one in Peckham. Flat. In my old flat in uh, Brighton, when I used to live in Brighton, we used to have a room that we, we used as a storage area next door. But it still had the original gas-fired washing machine and hand mangle. In yeah, our, in we, our we had area. we had this in our flat in Peckham in 1969. 1969. There was a room that had washing machines. Yep. I think there was tumble dryers, and I, that used to be my little room. And I would have dinner in there. My, I would sit in this little room all on my own, and my mum would bring me bring me dinner in there. And I'd sit there and have my dinner on me. <laughs> like my den. Now, another thing, Adam, I've been on to Bristow this morning about my shower thing, and they oh, haven't yep. got one either. I spent some time again, so I'm going to go out and get some glue today. I'll try and glue it together and see if I can find some sort of clip also to put yep. around it and maybe that'll help yeah maybe maybe that will help maybe you could go to a camping shop and get a, a small jubilee clip because obviously they use small jubilee clips on the gas pipes to hold the um gas bottles on but they've got so screws might... on the side haven't they that's true yeah that would get in the it way, won't go it? around it's, you know it's got to be just the metal uh, i'm looking for something that you could kind of sprung you know perhaps that you can open a bit yeah. with a pair of pliers and then clip it on and let it go and it, it, it clip it like that but i don't know where oh, i'm going to find go, some. maybe go to halfords and see if you can get um some sort of um spring circlet spring circlet circlet how do you spell that uh sprung uh circlet uh c is it c i r c l i p circlet, circlet. okay I'll see if it's I can like, find something um, like that. It, it, um, it, it's basically a round circular thing, and it's got two little holes in it. You get a pair of pointed pliers and pull it apart. That's the thing. That's what I'm looking for. That's what I'm looking yeah. for. Yeah, yeah. Probably Halfords would do something like that. That is what I'm looking know. for. Okay, I'll have a look in Halfords for something like that. Or I might even look on Amazon yeah. there. But I'll take, get a little bit of glue later. That's it. Take your control knob with you and uh, Good. flop it out and ask them. Uh, Excellent. Yeah, Find it something like that. Yeah, a bit of glue as well. All right, Adam, have a lovely day, sir. Are you, where are you on your way to, Brighton? I, I am indeed. You're right. You must be psychic. Say hello to the <laughs> seaside for me and hove actually, hove actually. <laughs> yes, I'm going down to the uh, station toilet to uh, to unblock them. So oh, I have you on in rather you I than me. Have... Put a mask on, dear. You've got to I be will. be aware of the blowbacks, all right? 
I will. I'll have you. I'll. I'll have you blaring in the gents' toilet. Thank you very much. I like to be, be heard in there. Cheerio. You'll be good. <laughs> Bye. Bye now. Adam the plumber calling in uh, from his car. There. Uh, he's got one of those blooming iPhone Seven Pluses that you never. They never. They just dreadful phones. They are. I mean, they're fantastic for the internet, but people move them uh, slightly away from their mouth, and you can't hear them again. You know, I have rows with people who are using these because they don't believe that you... They say it's your ear. Your ear. Ear old, ear old. Good morning, Danny. How are you today? Good morning, Chris. I'm good, thank you. All are right. you? You're ringing about a, a flat experience, are you? Well, not my own. My sister's. OK, yes. Uh, so my sister lives, obviously, in Wrexham Town Centre um, and her flat is, um, like, very old sandstone. Right. So it's very cold and the windows are single glazed. Blimey, and single mold, glazed windows. Have people still got those? Yeah. The, 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 Gosh. The, the building is, is is ridiculously old. Yes. Anyway, um, so she's got mould in the bathroom, in her kitchen, in her living room. And she's told the landlord and the landlord doesn't want to know. Really? Well, he's, um, he's got to do something about it, hasn't he? I would, I would. Is, is, uh, is, seriously, seriously, when there's something wrong with my flat, I want it flats. I, I want them repaired yesterday. I don't want someone to move out. Yeah, exactly. But the the the, the, the landlord is a solicitor. So. So what it's difference not does like, that matter? Don't know, make I, any difference at all. A landlord's a landlord. Don't matter whether they work in blooming McDonald's or they're a high court judge. They are. There are rules and regulations that they have to look after their places. You can't have someone living I, in Mo. How long has this been going on for? Oh, a couple of months now. Right. Um, she's taken evidence to the local council. Yes, that she needs a new house. Right. That's the thing to do. Yes. Yes. Um. So I've I've told her on numerous amounts of key, a, a numerous amounts of times just don't pay the rent just don't pay the rent. No, you can't do that. Can't do that. I'm afraid. Can't do that. You've got to because keep paying the rent. If you don't pay the rent, you haven't got a leg to stand on. You have to keep paying the rent. You can't. But then it comes because she she said to him a numerous amount of times, "I've got this mould. You need to come and sort it out." Yes, yes, I understand that. So you have to take action against him. You've got to take action against him. But you not paying a rent is not legal. That's not legal. You're, you're, you're doing something wrong there. If you keep paying a rent, eventually he will have to do something about it. Wait, may I is, ask, is may he... I ask, if she's not that happy, why don't she just go somewhere else then? Because she's happy, in where, she's happy with the location because everything she's got is... She's in the centre of the town, so right. she can, she's got everything around her. Yes, um, happy. It's it's not a massive place, you but know. She, it's a one bedroom. But she, has she? She's been to the council with these photographs. Are they coming round to her flat to have a look? No, it's so she can move. That's what she, she wants to move because she's had enough. Right. But you just but said she was happy where she is. She's happy, but she's not happy with with the with the mould and stuff. That the landlord doesn't want to do anything. Right. So, so she should go evidence. with these photographs to the council to complain about the landlord. The council will then send someone round. They will look at the situation and say, this is very bad. We will be in contact with the landlord and they will come down on the landlord like a ton of bricks. I'm telling you that now. That's what she's got to do. Do not not pay the rent. Very bad move. Very bad move. But but the, the the thing is, I've read tenancy agreements in the past because I've had them, and it says that the landlord must do this. The landlord Correct. must do yes, that. Correct. Yes, yes, and he so must. So if he's not, if he's not, if he's not stepping up to the mark when she's complaining about yes. things, he's therefore in breach of his contract. Yes. At which point you need to take action against him by going to the council, telling them the situation. They will send someone round. Look at the situation. OK, we'll sort this out. They will go turn down to the landlord, take him on like a ton of bricks. You take you not paying rent. You are taking this on on yourself. You have decided not to pay the rent, not, you know, well, it's not fair. So we're not paying the rent. That that's that's kind of what you've done there. Right. 
The law mm. says you must keep paying the rent. The fact that, you know, you're living in a house that's only, you know, it's fallen down, there's only one brick left, that's neither here nor there. You must continue to pay the rent and then get hold of the council and take the action like that. But you see what it's I mean? private, will the council still not yes. do anything? Yes. No, of course they come round. You've got rights. You, she can't be living in a place that's full of mould. The council will tell them, you know, j just because it's a private thing, th you know, it's like, um, let's think, um, let me think of an example of something else. Um, OK, so if I've got an electrical cable outside my house, right, and it's laying on yeah. the ground and it's live and someone steps on it, right, the mm. council won't come round to me about that. That's dangerous out there. But it's my house. Doesn't matter. It's dangerous. Same situation. Same situation. You have a mouldy house. The council want to know about it. They send someone round. Come down on the landlord. You need to sort this out. And then that'll be that. Then he will have to sort it out. And if he doesn't, you take it even further. So, and then which would be like court action and things yes, like that. Yes, yes, quite possibly. But obviously my sister won't be able to have the funds to available to sue him. So, uh... I don't think that costs money. I think you don't go to the council. Don't know. Haven't been down that route. But you need but, to go you know, to the council. That's your first thing. You've tried the landlord. He hasn't sorted it out. You now go to the council and you tell them you want this sorted out. That here's the hmm. problem. The landlord's not doing anything about it. Probably actually first. The first thing they do is probably write or ring up the landlord first before they even go in, go round. Give him a chance to do it. But she shouldn't have to live in that situation. I know I've said this too, and she, you know, when when I see her and that she gets upset and she starts, I can't live like this anymore. Well, I've said just, just you know, contact the landlord or even go to the council. But she's taken things now to the council, right? And now she's got to wait because the council won't act directly straight away. Will right. they? You know well, what councils are like. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Taking photos to the council to get your to get a council place may not be the same as taking photographs to the council to complain about your landlord. That may well be a different department. I would look into that if I were you. That I tell you what, do yourself a favour, Adam. Put the phone down on me. Pick up your pick up the phone to your council. Say, hello, my sister rents a private place. Uh, it's full of mould and the landlord's not doing anything about it. Can you help? And they will put you through to the right department. Come back to me on perhaps if we do a show tomorrow and let me know what happens. Well, I'll give you a private call. No, no, we, we want to hear. Everyone's heard this now. They want to uh, know what's going on. Wendy says right. it's environmental health. They work for everybody regardless, you see. Right. OK. OK. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, let us know, Danny. We want to know how that, how that goes on. There'll be people listening to the show now that want to know how you get on with that, all right? I'll give you. I'll give you a call as soon as as soon as you as soon as you uh, come back on live. Please do. I appreciate it. But now, put the phone down on me. Ring them up straight away and tell them what you've just told me. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Chris. All right. Lots of love to you. Bye bye, Danny. Good luck Cheers. to your sister. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Now, there we are, boys and girls. A couple of calls for you this morning. That was that was interesting, wasn't it? Uh, lines are now closed. Please don't call in now, gang. Lines are now closed. I'm afraid, boys and girls, uh, because we must just uh, finish up. My mate will be coming around soon and uh, we're going swimming around about 11 o'clock. So let's just go back to some of your other messages. Uh, John Aitken says, when I lived in Earl's Court in 1991-1992, my room was just £70 a week, all inclusive, with a payphone. Wow, payphones. When's the last time you saw one of those payphones? Gosh, that was a long time ago, wasn't it? Blimey. Uh, oh, Ronnie's with us. Well, you can come round now, Ronnie. I'm nearly ready. I'm, do you know, I'm dying for a cup. Any chance of a cup of tea before we go? I'm really as dry as anything now. Uh, Wendy says, I have to cope with answering the phones at work to people using iPhone 7s. They are a nightmare. And they really, they really, they are. iPhone 7s are an absolute nightmare. They move the phone slightly away from their mouths and you can't blooming hear them anymore, can you? Oh, dear. Right, let's do today's uh, birthdays, boys and girls. And then we'll uh, disappear. Happy birthday today to my good friend, Matthew Joplin. It, now, it says 34, Matt. I don't think you're 34, but I will wish you happy birthday at 34 years old today, as that's what it says on your note there. Happy birthday to Matthew, 34 today. Uh, Simon Marcelli is 48 years old today. Lovely surname. Marcelli, I love that. Happy birthday to you, Simon. Happy birthday to 
Bwambao Robert. Bwambao Robert. I hope I've said that name right. 32 today. That's a great age, 32. I think it was probably my favourite age, 32 years old. Uh, Daniel Broadbent. He does karaoke nights. Happy birthday to you, sir. Uh, Chris Mannion. Happy birthday. Russ Raymond. Hello, Russ. 40 years old today, little Russ. Bless his heart. Happy birthday. And Irvin Distiller. Oh, our very, very good friend, Irvin Distiller, is 70 years old today. Wow. Congratulations, you got there. <laughs> Here comes the song, gang. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Enjoy your birthday, boys and girls. Tonight, it's Friday night, so I'll be hosting uh, karaoke tonight. That's at Central Station Bar in Wharfdale Road, King's Cross. OK, so Central Station Bar tonight, Wharfdale Road, King's Cross for the karaoke. Starts at 8.30 and finishes at midnight. Do come along, free entry. Lots of wonderful singers and, and some fantastic characters for you there every Friday. Tonight, Central Station Karaoke, tonight and every Friday, 8.30 till midnight. Enjoy the rest of your Friday and thank you very much for joining me this morning. I'll see you again very soon. Cheerio now.